My name is Bill Porter. I am an assistant professor of English here at City Tech, and we're happy to have all of you here for the Science Fiction Symposium, our third annual Science Fiction Symposium. Uh, so this panel uh, is American Culture and Media, and we have three great panelists, and I'll introduce them uh, first, and then they'll uh, give their talks, and we will uh, have some Q&A session uh, after they've uh, given their papers. So first we have Aaron Barlow, who teaches English at the City Tech, New York City College of Technology, CUNY. Um, and he does much more than that. <laughs> author of numerous books. And I'll just mention one uh, recent uh, co-edited volume with uh, Professor Laura Westengard, uh, The 25 Sitcoms That Changed Television, which we just had a great event for um, last semester. So our next speaker is Marlene Barr. Uh, Marlene Barr is known for her pioneering work in feminist science fiction and teaches English at City University of New York. She has won the Science Fiction Research Association Pilgrim Award for Lifetime Achievement in Science Fiction Criticism. Barr is the author of Alien to Femininity, Speculative Fiction and Feminist Theory, Lost in Space, Probing Feminist Science Fiction, and Beyond Feminist Fabulation. Um, oh, sorry, oh, sorry, Probing Feminist Science Fiction and Beyond, Feminist Fabulation, Space, Postmodern Fiction, and uh, Genre Fiction, a New Discourse Practice for Cultural Studies. Barr has edited many anthologies and co-edited the science fiction issue of PMLA. She is the author of the novels Oi Pioneer, which is an academic novel, I need to read that one, um, and Oi Feminist Planets, a fake memoir. Her latest publication is When Trump Changed, the first single authored short story collection about Trump. So we're anxiously uh, waiting to hear about, more about that. And uh, we have Sharon Packer, uh, who was with us last year at the Science Fiction Symposium. Uh, she is uh, a physician and psychiatrist who is in private practice and is assistant clinical professor at Econ School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. She is the author of several books that link science, psychiatry, and the humanities, including Neuroscience and Science Fiction Film, Cinema Sinister Psychiatrists, Movie and the Modern Psyche, Superheroes and Super Egos, The Mind Behind the Masks, Dream and Myth, Medicine and Movies. And she edited two multi-volume books on evil in American popular culture and mental illness in popular culture. She writes regular articles on why psychiatrists are physicians first for Psychiatric Times. And uh, last year she presented to us on uh, Luke Cage, Comics and Race Based Unethical Medical Experiments. And she'll be talking to us about Jessica Jones uh, today. All right, so turn it over to our panelists. And you want me to start? Sure. Okay. I want to start with two uh, quotes I jotted down from uh, Dr. Levinson this morning. Uh, first he said, the consequences of the uh, golem uh, went far beyond what the uh, rabbi of Prague intended. And I think what I'm talking about, you'll see, is odd consequences, unexpected uh, consequences of uh, Frankenstein. He also said Frankenstein <coughs> is best considered uh, with the uh, uh, development of the motif in the movies, and I will be dealing with that to some degree, too. I'll be talking about a later movie, Young Frankenstein, although the Frankenstein movies really reached their height in the years, uh, the decade or so before uh, World War II. In 1939, when Mel Brooks was 12 or 13 here in Brooklyn, and Gene Wilder was six or seven out in Milwaukee. They both probably saw young Mr. Lincoln starring Henry Fonda. They were that kind of boys. The movie was a fanciful tale sparked by the life of our 16th president, but with little relation to its reality. The next year, the two would have seen young Buffalo Bill starring Roy Rogers, a movie with even less of a tether to reality. Given their age differences, Brooks probably laughed while Wilder ate it up. A few months, months later, they both likely watched another Rogers quick, uh, quickie, young Bill Hickok, one, one more of Hollywood's supposed histories with little relation to actual events. A cultural magpie, Brooks certainly fill, uh, filed these titles and their relations to the real world away in his commodious storehouse of Americana. Wilder must have smiled at the movies with what would become his signature half smirk, but I suspect also with admiration a great deal less ironic than that of his future collaborator. Another movie that came out that year, in 1939, one more among the many things that the two would remember years later when they looked back 
after the 30s and 40s to create their young Frankenstein, this one was the first effort in America by Alfred Hitchcock. And both boys probably saw that too, Rebecca. That one also puts itself forward as a history, though only internally. And it starts with the line, last night I dreamt I went to Manderley again. Ah, oh, boy, is it a uh, soft story. That's a scary one too. Uh, Brooks knew the difference. Wilder would learn it. Hitchcock's film was an adaptation of a novel. Its reality was determined by author Daphne du Maurier. By that time, both boys had already seen the highly successful Universal Pictures production of Frankenstein and, very likely, had first reacted with delighted fright. Released in 1931, it had embedded Mary Shelley's story more firmly in American culture than Du Maurier's novel, but with many more of its own twists, ones as fanciful in relation to the original as those of the young movies the boys would see a few years later. Today, as a result of this movie and its sequels, Frankenstein has become a cultural touchstone as familiar to generations of Americans as, say, Monopoly. Unfortunately, though, the original book remains little more than a curiosity, a truth behind the story so that is has little cultural relevance as the realities of the lives of Abe Lincoln, Bill Cody, and Bill Hickok. Uh, by the time Brooks and Wilder were teenagers, uh, much from the Americanized version of the story was firmly embedded in the culture. The laboratory of the movie with its arcing electricity, the streaks of white in the hair of the bride of Fa Frankenstein in one sequel, and the hunchback character of Igor, and then later Igor, who evolved from Fritz in the first movie, and a number of variations over the decade that followed, and much more. Even by the 1940s, these become part of American popular culture, even if they had not become, by law, part of the commons that is available to everyone without permission. The spoof that Brooks and Wilder would create in 1974 and name with a nod to the silly and otherwise forgotten Rogers Westerns of their youth, Young Frankenstein was only possible because of the ubiquitous nature of this new Frankenstein manifestation, itself a monster cobbled together from Shelley's novel American, American Feeble Impressions of Eastern Europe and Hollywood's overexcited imagination in the early sound era. Today, I suspect that more Americans know the Frankenstein story through Brooks and Wilder than through the collective movies from the 30s and 40s, and certainly more than through Shelley's novel. This spoof has become our Frankenstein story. All of the others are simply antecedents, hardly causal uh, in our casual consideration. Today, what we know mostly incorrectly in historical and liter literary, not cultural terms, as the Frankenstein story is the popular American tale that is as much a child of this country as the Simpsons. So whose story is it? The American descendant of Mary Shelley's Victor Frankenstein and the Henry Frankenstein of the 1931 film, Frederick Frankenstein affects what he imagines a European pronunciation of his name. Frankenstein, he corrects people. Only at the end does he proclaim himself as carrying the name with the pronunciation we know, claiming his legacy, an American one, the right one, given the popular conception of the tale. The question is, who owns it? In the instance of Shelley, the answer is simple. Frankenstein is passed into the commons. The U.S. Constitution reads, to, uh, to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right of their respective writings and discoveries. Shelley's limited time had long passed, if she ever had it. American publishers in the 19th century often assumed American copyright only applied to American publications, so pirated the British at will. Wilder's Frankenstein may claim his legacy but who owned it in an American court of law? Brooks understands the pastiche nature of American culture. In fact, he has made his career by parroting the willy-nilly, cut-and-paste nature of much of our knowledge. 
Americans frequently mistake con contingency for causality, leading to hilarious misapprehension. And they often assume that the historical and the present, present are much the same, just in different clothing. And their laws protect only that clothing. Playing constantly to an audience steeped in American popular culture, Brooks and co-writer Wilder, though I suspect it was primarily Brooks, dropped tidbits into the uh, movie, such as lines from the Glenn Miller song, Chattanooga Choo Choo, which would be recognized not simply because of the song, but because of the jokes playing off the song's first line. Pardon me, boy, is this the Chattanooga Choo Choo? For their punchlines. One of these, in fact, features Roy Rogers. Pardon me, Roy, is this the cat who chewed your new shoes? <laughs> Brooks and Wilder were certainly playing with the cliches of their childhood, many of them under copyright, while others not, while writing this movie. Not only was Chattanooga Choo Choo a hit in 1941, but that is also the time of popularization of the phrase, a roll in the hay for sex, a phrase used in the introduction of Terry Garr's character, who appears, of course, in a hay wagon. Soon after, on seeing the huge door knockers at the Frankenstein Castle, Wilder, who is in the process of lifting Gar to the ground and has his face close to her breast, turns his eyes to the door and says appreciatively, What knockers? Thank you, she responds almost demurely. Knockers, in the usage she, is, she assumes, also came to popularity in the 1940s. Seconds later, we meet Frau Blucher, an homage to Rebecca's Mrs. Danvers, here played by Cloris Leachman. Another reference to a copyrighted aspect of American popular culture of the 1940s. Soon, soon comes use of the game charades, still popular in the 40s, and Pig Latin, a staple of 30s comedy, a parody of Groucho Marx, and a bit of that quintessential American anthem, The Battle Hymn of the Republic. The authors don't spare the darker aspects of the 1940s. The police officer who stirs anti-monster sentiment has a German accent, bringing up the specter of anti-Semitism. Even more intriguing is the choice of Irving Berlin's putting on the Ritz for a dance number starring uh, Dr. Frankenstein and the monster. The song's original lyrics set it in Harlem, the people described as African American. It was used in a 1930 film with one of the first integrated dance ensembles. Later, revised lyrics were produced by Berlin, moving the locale from Lenox Avenue to Park Avenue and adding a line about Gary Cooper. This was for a 1939 version by Clark Gable. The Cooper line is used in the excerpt from the song in Young Frankenstein, just before the audience starts booing and throwing things at the human monster duo on stage. Brooks and Wilder keep it subtle, but here again they touch back to the American culture of the 40s, reminding us of its racism. Another aspect of the way Brooks and Wilder use popular culture and its icons is the implicit challenge to ownership of those icons, in much the way that would soon be put forward by the fan fiction uh, in relation uh, to Star Wars, Harry Potter, and much more starting in the 1980s. The team was quite aware of how close they sometimes skated to the edges of intellectual property laws, often assuming permissions uh, through uh, negotiations, and uh, often assuring permissions through negotiations and payments, but sometimes ending up in legal wrangling, such as was happening while Young Frankenstein was being made. Actress, director, and inventor Hedy Lamar sued Warner Brothers over the running joke relating to her name and that of a character in the just-released Blazing Saddles, Hedley Lamar. The name, after all, was her trademark protected property. The limited time of copyright has been expanded almost since the ratification of the Constitution. What was once a 13-year protection, renewable once, has become the author's lifetime plus 75 years, or about a century for corporations. It will be increased again, and soon, for Mickey Mouse will be 100 late in the next decade, and Disney is not about to lose control over that lucrative image. <laughs> Comedians, in particular, have never liked the restriction of copyright. Uh, Claudio Marx, worried by a Warner Brothers inquiry about his spoof, A Night in Casablanca, of their Casablanca, shot off a letter. You claim you own Casablanca and that no one else can use the name without their permission. What about Warner Brothers? Do you own that too? 
you probably have the right to use the name Warner, but what about brothers? Professionally, we were brothers long before you were. When Vitaphone was still a gleam in the inventor's eye, we were touring the sticks as the Marx brothers, and even before us, there had been other brothers, the Smith brothers, the brothers Karamazov, Dan brothers, an outfielder with Detroit, and brother, can you stare, spare me a dime? Everything is built on the past. All that is new is also theft. That's part of the concept of the Constitution's limited time. The Founding Fathers understood that creation of the new depends on ability to use the past. They also wanted to ensure that creators could profit from their work, so they created their compromise, one that has been warped by every copyright extension to the point where Mary Bono, who had replaced her son, uh, husband Sonny in Congress on his, de on his death, could say, uh, say at the Capitol, Sonny wanted the term of copyright protection to last forever. I'm informed by staff that such a change would violate the Constitution. I invite all of you to work with me to strengthen our copyright laws uh, in all the ways available to us. As you know, there is also Jack Valente's uh, proposal for term to last forever less one day. Of course, for forever minus a day is the same as forever. Bono's attitude is what every artist fights, even ones who later themselves become its advocates. Walt Disney coming first to mind. Comedians, on the other hand, are generally on the other side, fighting through their work to expand the commons. They do this through parody and spoof, taking all of the popular markers of a particular time and insisting that they belong to the people, not the creators. Nothing in Young Frankenstein has much at all to do with Shelley's novel. It has all to do with the 1930s and early 1940s. The movie shows that these items, some of them once the possessions of particular entities, now belong to all of us. Implicit in the movie is that 30 years is more than enough time for something to move from possession to commons. There's no explicit reference to Mrs. Danvers in the Flav Luker character of Young Frankenstein. There doesn't need to be. We all already own Mrs. Danvers. Here's the thing. Shelley's novel was so old by the time that the Wales film was made that there was no question of copyright protection. Even by today's standards, the book would be part of the commons. Shelley died in 1851, so copyright would have lapsed in 1926, five years before the film was released, were today's laws in force then. Though the new movie was under copyright, the story was not. Another movie from the 30s that both Brooks and Wilder surely saw in the days before World War II was Naughty Marietta. Based on an operetta already a quarter of a century old, it starred Jeanette MacDonald and Nelson Eddy, a popular musical comedy duo, duo of films at the time. And it featured the song, Ah, Sweet Mystery of Life. That song, too, appears in snippets in Young Frankenstein. The line used is, Ah, Sweet Mystery of Life, At Last I Found You. The mystery belongs to all of us, or should, as should the rewards of discovery. I think Mel Brooks, one of the greatest purveyors of American popular culture, and Gene Wilder would agree. Thank you. in the White House, I felt that I had to do something about it. And what academics do when they see a problem and they try to extricate themselves from that problem is they write. So I said, what can I do? I decided I have to write. So the situation is I find myself being the author of a collection of my own stories called When Trump Changed, the Feminist Science Fiction Justice League Quashes the Orange Outrage Pussy Grammar. <laughs> And I spent the year in outrage writing these stories, and I took all the fantasy and science fiction tropes that I knew, and I threw them in Trump. I locked him in the Phantom Zone. I had feminist extraterrestrials come, come after him. I made him climb up a beanstalk and stay up there. You get the idea. And I tried to do it with, with Mel Brooks' humor in the, in the best way that I could. And I wear two hats. 
on the one hand, I'm a, I'm a feminist science fiction scholar, and late in life, I decided I had a very humorous voice, and I decided to start writing science fiction. And now that I've written the science fiction about Trump, I did it because I wanted to turn science fiction into something useful in terms of making it resistance literature in relation to Trump, because I was always interested in science fiction and social change. So when I'm home and I'm with my husband and I act like a Jewish wife and I say, wear your coat and this is what's wrong with you, he <laughs> says to me, you are not that kind of doctor. <laughs> but I am the kind of doctor that I can name and specify what it is that I've created here. And I think that when Trump changed, is Trump punk, a new term. So what I'm going to do the, this afternoon is put on my scholar hat, not my humorous fiction hat, and I'm going to explain to you what I think Trump punk is. And if you want the humorous part, here's the book, and you can go and get it. So the title of my paper is Trump punk resists presidential bunk or updating, obscuring mirror shades which is Bruce Sterling's symbol for cyberpunk, with revelatory magnifying glasses, enhances seeing the forces of normalcy. And I think that Trump punk gives us cognitive estrangement from Trump, Trump, from Trump, <laughs> and it shows us that this is not normal. I have defined feminist fabulation as feminist metafiction, fiction about patriarchal fictions, which reveal patriarchal imperatives. In this vein, I propose Trump punk as political metafiction, speculative fiction that resists normalizing Trump authentic fictions involving alternative truths or more directly stated lies. Ruth Sterling explains that mirror shades symbolize cyberpunk. Quote, mirrored sunglasses have been a movement totem since the early days of 82. By hiding the eyes Mirror shades prevent the forces of normalcy from realizing that one is crazed and possibly dangerous. They are the symbol of the sun starring visionary, unquote. Trump punk requires a newly relevant totem to signify the need clearly to see that crazed and dangerous President Trump stands outside the forces of normalcy. My purpose is to explain that Trump punks hyperbolic response is resistance literature which assuages becoming desensitized to the American president's deviance. When Trump goes low, Trump punk goes satirical in a fantastic vein. Or, for example, when Trump says, lock her up in re reference to Hillary Clinton, Trump punk's response is to relegate him to phantom zone incarceration. Trump is an orange outrage, reckless to the extent that he did not use protective sunglasses when directly staring at a solar eclipse. Trump punk also eschews sunglasses. Trump punk replaces mirror shades with magnifying glasses, which underscore that resistance to Trump necessitates violent, violent, vigilant awareness that the daily Trump show barrage is aberrant and abnormal, not routine and mundane. This new symbol, which denotes estrangement, stands for more clearly seeing the mandated reader response interpretation, Times columnist Frank Brunei calls pretend, quoting Brunei. We're supposed to pretend that Trump gives a fig about the core. Above all, we're supposed to pretend that what he says today has any bearing on what he'll say tomorrow when he said what he said yesterday contradicted it. Our president is in a world of sand and wind and make-believe, a shifting, swirling, fantastical context. I'm not that good at pretend, unquote. We can't normalize Trump by complacently viewing him as a garden variety president. It is more appropriate to equate him with Stanislaw Lem's ever-changing Star Diaries protagonist, E. John Tishy. Trump's smoke and mirror reality television show a shifting sand and wind phantasmagoria is akin to Van de McIntyre's speculative novel that title of Miss Grass and Sand. Trump punk resists becoming good at pretend. 
Times columnist Charles M. Blow seems to point to magnifying glasses becoming Mirashade's successor, a new signifier of textual resistance. Blow says, quote, Trump sees the world as if in a house of mirrors, everything reflecting some distorted version of him. He really always seems to return to a kind of delusional narcissism, unquote. Distorting magnifying glasses supersede mirror shades in that they enlarge the reflected astigmatism Trump projects. Magnifying glasses effectively symbolize enlarging Trump's distorted narcissistic reflections to facilitate seeing through these delusions. Magnifying glasses function as a preventative to becoming lost in the funhouse of Trump's enlarged house of mirrors self-obsessions. Trump punk then turns Trump's distortions into even more magnified and exaggerated distortions, speculative fictions which encourage seeing his delusions more clearly as delusions. In this vein, Stephen Colbert takes on Trump's fantasy response to the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School mass shooting it epitomizes Trump punk. Trump ludicrously presents himself as a death-defying hero. Colbert says, quote, but I think I really <coughs> believe I'd run in there, excuse me, this is what Trump said, quoting Trump. Yeah. But I think I, I really believe I'd run in there at the school even if I didn't have a weapon, unquote. Colbert magnifies Trump's delusional distortion by recasting him as a speculative fiction protagonist to exaggerate it further. The comedian begins with the mundane, the regular temporality of the rising sun. Colbert says, at this point, I go to bed every night believing there's nothing Trump could say or do that could possibly surprise me. Then the sun comes up, and it happened again today, unquote. Then Colbert abruptly deviates from sunrise sunset predictability to go in for the speculative fiction transformation kill. Colbert says, quote, as long as you're living in a fantasy world, at least make it interesting. I would have run and hit the shooter with my laser beam eyes, then use my mind like Neo in the Matrix and fly away to space, Mar-a-Lago, space a lago, unquote. <laughs> Colbert's monologue recasts Trump in terms of speculative fiction to shed light on his delusional narcissism. Refusing to play pretend along with Trump, Colbert uses speculative fiction to make the inanity of the president's hero story nonsense more visible, huger. In contrast to Trump's business as usual characters, New Jersey Senator Cory Booker ran into a fire to save people. A potential future President Booker could conceivably manifest the heroism Trump falsely ascribes to himself. Booker would not, however, use laser beams to become Neo. By exaggerating and magnifying Trump's distortion, Colbert resists it and hence relegates it to the normal. Neverland, or in Colbert's words, quote, that's Trump's hero's fantasy, really stupid. But he said it, and you can't say that he didn't say it, can you? So Trump's got all kinds of fantasies about what he'd say in the school, unquote. It's necessary to portray Trump as a Trump punk speculative fiction character because in the age of alternative facts and fake news, it becomes possible to say that he didn't say it. Colbert's <coughs> description of the sun is not science fictional, something that is fantastically off, such as the scenario in Isaac Asimov's The Scribes in Nightfall. According to Colbert, <coughs> the threat radiates from Trump, not from the comfortingly predictable sun. His use of Trump punk lets the sun shine in to illuminate the fact that is truth, justice, and the American way. Trump punk replaces becoming desensitized with clearly seeing that Trump <coughs> is transforming America into absurdistan. This speculative fiction subgenre proclaims that those who oppose Trump are mad as hell, and we're not going to take it anymore. Millions of mad as hell women responded to Trump's pussy grabbing by marching in pussy hats, turning themselves into literal pussy galore. Their ambulatory knitted pink hats magnified Trump's toxic misogyny for all to see. Bruce Sterling describes a similar creative and enhanced view. 
quote Sterling, with this intensity of vision comes strong imaginative concentration, unquote. Or, in other words, magnification of Trump's absurdity is Trump Trump. May I tell writers who won't take it anymore to use strong imaginative concentration to create Trump Trump magnified vision. Howard Jacobson, for example, turned his strong imaginative concentration into the first novel about Trump, a satirical fairy tale called Pussy, a novel. J.F. Gerard and Jen Frankel include alternative history scenarios in their their anthology, Trump Utopia or Dystopia, or Trump Utopia or Dystopia. Trump punk is not flooding bookstores, however. Literary agent Johnny Geller explains that, quote, the commercial view among publishers seems to be that people are living it, Trumpism, and haven't got the head space for reading it. It's a lack of courage and imagination, unquote. BQ Press shows no such lack of courage and imagination. BQ Press is the nexus of Trump punk. Founder Bob Brown states that, quote, BQ Press was founded in the throes of desperation as like so many Americans in 2016, I searched for an outlet for the anger and frustration that came from seeing the America I grew up in torn away from my heart." Unquote. In, after the, in the BQ anthologies After the Orange and, and the Alternative series, Brown gathers a cadre of speculative writers who are angered and frustrated, that is to say, as mad as hell as he is. I am grateful that Brown has the courage to go against the grain of publishing successes <coughs> Geller describes. BQ is the publisher of my web when Trump changed. My Trump punk anthology story served as an outlet for the anger and frustration I felt after seeing my place of origin, Forest Hills, Queens, located a stone's throw away from Trump's childhood home in Jamaica States, torn from my heart. Like, how can I be from the place where this monster comes from? I am ashamed that our misogynistic abomination president comes from Queens. In response, I have authored a satirical guide to the Trump revenge fantasy gallery. I subject Trump to close encounters with feminist extraterrestrials, alternative Hillary winning history, Godzilla-esque male metamorphosis locked up in the phantom zone, and that's on a good day. In the end, I transform, transport Trump to a galaxy far, far away from us. Wearing my well-worn speculative fiction scholar hat, I can state with authority that I and my fellow BQ authors are creating Trump punk. How might Trump punk respond? How might Trump respond to this new genre? Well, he, will he call speculative fiction a false fake genre? Will he expect feminist extraterrestrials to characterize him as a very stable genius? Trump punk is powerful. here of some of the books that I did just because I like the covers. Mm -hmm. And I like the covers, but so does Frankenstein. Yeah, I mm -hmm. somehow uh, into Mary Shelley. And here's uh, Frankenstein reading one of those books, and here's a picture of his most recent chapter. But uh, anyhow, who is Jessica Jones? And let me tell you how this came about in terms of doing this. As uh, it was pointed out by the professor who introduced me, I spoke on Nick uh, Luke Cage last year. And I have to confess that I have much fonder feelings for Luke Cage because I think he really ties into society for some important public health information um, inadvertently. And I think this does just the opposite. But I'll explain why I think that is. And I wish I could give more of an endorsement, but there's my disclaimer. <coughs> I'm um, anyhow, Jessica Jones, before she appeared in Netflix, she actually appeared in a couple comic books, Alias from 2001 to 2004 and then The Pulse. But it was really her introduction 
On Netflix, a really brought her a much wider audience. Um, Netflix cast a wider net beyond just the usual comic con type people and the usual geeks and the people who read comics and sci-fi. And it made it into, um, it was actually um, advertised as kind of a feminist superhero. And in fact, Forbes magazine actually proclaimed Jessica Jones to be the best TV, on, best show on television in 2015. She got rave reviews, a return season, and now I hear most recently even a third season is coming up. So, um, she also showed up with the Defenders, the Daredevil, Luke Cage, and Iron Fist. And for better or for worse, uh, Luke Cage and Iron Fist were canceled. I could give, care less about Iron Fist. I thought Luke Cage was very interesting. Um, but she's there for two or, two or three seasons, uh, whereas they were lost for whatever reasons. Um, I don't know. But anyhow, what about Jessica Jones and why does she constitute a superhero? We don't even know what the extent of her superpowers are. She, we know we can, she can lift cars effortlessly. She can fly or at least resist falling, as you see in this particular cover. She can punch a healthy heart and stop it from beating, as happened when she hit Luke Cage's fiance, Reba. Um, she resists injury, uh, like uh, Wolverine. And, but most significantly here to this discussion, uh, am I not talking about anything? No? Okay, I'm sorry about that. Oh, I didn't turn it up. Okay. Uh, most significantly, she has an extremely high alcohol tolerance. She drinks straight from the bottle, and sometimes she drinks not just one bottle, but two bottles. Um, and that's really the gist of this talk, but really uh, focuses on here. But what about, before we talk about her drinking, uh, let's talk about what her daily life is like. She lives in a tawdry apartment. She has her own office. She has a private eye practice. She converses with her neighbors and shows concerns about them. She chastises her drug-using neighbor for using drugs, but she continues to drink as she does this. And she meets and beds bars, strangers in bars, Blue Cage included, and she needs no coercion to work with them, except for Kilgrave, who is the arch nemesis here, who's accused of immobilizing and raping her. Um, now, sometimes she functions as a good Samaritan, and sometimes she succeeds, like Superman or Luke Cage. She does manage to stop a neighbor from hanging. She's both basically, though, hired as a private eye. In, in that way, she's analogous to Luke Cage, who is a hero for hire. And she's hired to save a missing NYU student from whose parents come from out of town. Unfortunately, she does not succeed in that. She arrives too late to save the student, who actually kills herself in prison but she succeeds in identifying Kilgrave as the cause of all this. So what about this private eye practice she has? That's how she meets Luke Cage in this particular uh, story on Netflix, and also in Alias and The Pulse. She snoops on Luke Cage as a private eye. She's hired to get evidence of an affair that he's having with a married woman. The husband pay, uh, pays her to do this. And to show this infidelity, she takes photographs of Luke and his lover. Afterwards, she goes to Luke's bar, which she owns and operates, and she meets him there. Luke Cage is an ex-con, as we'll talk about a little bit later, so he likes to keep a low profile, doesn't want to attract the attention of the authorities, and he doesn't welcome Jessica's visits at all, but he doesn't rip off her sexual advances, advances until he learns that Jessica killed his fiance inadvertently. So I keep saying I'm going to talk about Luke Cage, well, I'm going to do that. Uh, Luke Cage is a 70 eras comic book icon who was an outgrowth of the black exploitation phase um, in that era. He was the most popular African American superhero, even though he's no longer wearing his yellow, yellow bandana or afro. I stress that he's the most popular African American superhero because he has been eclipsed more recently by an exclusively African superhero. But he is what he is, and he's an ex con who was wrongly convicted. Um, but he's eventually paroled in exchange for his voluntary participation in a vaccine study that's intended to uh, say, protect, confer immunity to all illness. However, a vindictive guard in prison overdoses Luke on chemicals, and um, in spite of the guard's nefarious intentions, Luke accidentally turns out super strong, and he acquires rock-hard skin. And this super strength allows him to spring from the cage, literally which is maybe where he gets his uh, powers. Now, the reason that I was interested in Luke Cage was because he has so many parallels with such important issues in public health. 
Uh, first of all, he recalls the Attica Prison Riot of 71, which uh, the uh, creators alluded to directly. Um, but more importantly to me, he parallels the prisoner medical experiments and the Tuskegee syphilis experiments from those years. Prisoner medical experiments were rather normative um, until they were banned in 1976, and they were banned from different states at different times. Eventually, all of them were banned in 1976. But very significantly, he connects to the Tuskegee horrible syphilis experiment conducted on black men, which actually went on from 1932 to 72 and was revealed in 1972 and was conducted by the United States Public Health Service in all places. Um, and that's a story unto itself. It was a story from last year. So anyhow, Luke Cage does connect with Jessica Jones in, in the Jessica Jones series. And uh, they have this romantic twi uh, liaison. But what's more concerning to me in terms of the public health aspect here is that Jessica becomes pregnant with Luke's baby when she's drinking constantly. And we're going to talk about the implications of that very soon. In the comic books, she uh, becomes pregnant, but she does not do that in Netflix yet. And I don't know if they're going to be able to pull that one off on Netflix, but we'll see. Um, she's paired with Ant-Man, but infidelity, I think, is a much lesser offense than creating uh, you know, a child with fetal alcohol syndrome, which doesn't show up yet. Uh, the pulse actually begins with the birth of Jessica's baby, which takes place in the same day as her wedding to Luke Cage. Um, but we'll see what happens with Netflix here. Um, but what about alcohol and Jessica Jones and alcohol advertising? Her friends, adopted family, her neighbors all comment on her drinking, but she's indifferent because she doesn't see this as a problem. Um, and contrarily, many fans who follow her history, they post her alcohol accomplishments online. These people clearly have a different attitude towards this than I do, and I admit I'm curmudgeon. Um, but there's one website that shows 23 shots of different alcoholic beverages that she drinks. Some of them have identifiable liquor labels, some are fictional brands. Um, and we could call this actually product placement. I'd imagine that they're making some money from having these identifiable brands. But anyhow, how does she drink so much? Well, supposedly her superpowers let her drink inordinate amounts of alcohol. And the upshot is that she never gets alcohol poisoning, which anyone else who's drinking the amount, amount would. So she never winds up in an emergency room to get help for this either for the drinking, alcohol poisoning, unconsciousness, perhaps even death, or trauma. She never falls over and hits her head and gets a subdural hematoma, which actually is a very common cause of death in people who drink. Um, she doesn't have sprained ankles from tripping down stairs. She doesn't bruise from falling down drunk. She never has motor vehicle accidents, which are quite common in people who drink. But unfortunately, people who drink are more likely to perpetrate injuries or death than other people rather than on themselves. And she's never killed by an oncoming car, even though 70% of pedestrian fatalities are legally intoxicated at the time that they're hit. And she never suffers from sexual assault apart from Kilgrave, even though we know that female binge drinkers, and college women in particular, are very much subject to sexual assaults when intoxicated. Uh, so Jessica doesn't have these things. So why does she wind up drinking? Maybe there's some reasons that this happens that are uh, evident in her past history. We know that she was orphaned on route to Disneyland vacation when she was riding with her family. She and her brother were quarreling, quarreling, they were fighting. Um, and uh, they distracted her father, and the father wound up losing control of the car, hitting an army convoy, which was filled with radioactive waste. Um, she spent months in a coma after this, unaware that her mother, father, and brother died. She was also unaware of the exposure to radioactive waste, radioactive waste, or its ability to confer superpowers. However, we comic book readers all know that radioactive waste can give superpowers to the likes of Spider-Man, the Hulk, the Fantastic Four, and many other uh, characters. Um, it's a real, what we call, the old term in psychiatry was reaction formation, where you have the exact opposite reaction to the reality. Instead of being fearful of radioactive waste and radiation sickness and poisoning and death, they say that they cause, they cause a superpowers. So by the time she regains consciousness, she's ready to be transferred to a home for wayward children. Obviously, she was a bit rambunctious even when young. And she's then adopted by a family named Jones, and then she adopts their surname. So these are these early life losses, which are quite important. 
And let's see if this possibly explains her alcohol use, for those of us who think it's problematic, which clearly Jessica doesn't. We do know that uh, PTSD and uh, early life losses actually connect to both depression and alcohol use. She's uh, allegedly been raped by Kilgrave when immobilized, and we know that women who've been sexually assaulted have a much higher incidence of alcohol or other substance use afterwards. Um, early life losses also predispose to depression, and depression predisposes to substance use. And we have this history, if we know about it, we can c connect the dots, but Jessica doesn't, and none of the people who know her uh, connect those dots, even though they comment on it. So what are the psychiatric effects of alcohol? Um, that affect people as adults, or affect women in particular. We know that alcohol causes increased rates of depression, increased rates of treatment-resistant depression, it increases psychicity in bipolar people, and persons with alcohol use disorders have more suicides, completed suicides, even when they're not intoxicated. But intoxication actually increases the odds of completed suicide. And as we know, sexual assault or date rape is common in binging, drinking, out college women, and this is a popular topic today, um, and, but it's been around for quite a while before it became popular. Um, so what does alcohol do to memory? It does all kinds of things, but it causes memory loss, temporary memory loss known as blackouts, it causes brain shrinkage. Now interestingly, or perhaps sadly, women are more vulnerable to the brain damage from alcohol than men are, and the alcohol damage appears sooner in women. I'm not going to get into the whole biology of this, but a lot of this is hormonally related on several different levels. Alcohol increases the risk of dementia, and unfortunately, dementia has a greater risk in women than in men. So it's not the kind of thing you really want to push. And confabulation is a peculiar disorder that occurs in alcohol use, where people who have memory impairments will respond to prompts um, about past life experiences that they never had. And it's an interesting thing, but we're not going to get too much into that. But let's look at some other neurotoxic effects of alcohol in women. Women get drunk faster if they're not superpowered like Jessica Jones, and they show neurotoxic effects in one third less alcohol than men, meaning that a woman who drinks two drinks is, has the same effects as a man who drinks three, a woman who drinks four has the effects as a man drinking six, and so on. Alcohol causes a whole bunch of other neuropathies, including nerve palsies, pains, vertices, and cephalopathy. Of course, it causes psychosis. Central Ponte Myelinosis, Marshafathic and Yami Syndrome, I can pronounce that better than some of these other words because I have to take it on tests. Um, but alcohol, so alcohol is, is, you know, in spite of the fact that it's quite popular and there's a very strong alcohol lobby, it causes a lot of medical problems. Um, now, does stopping alcohol save you from everything? Yes and no. Stopping alcohol suddenly actually can cause more dangerous problems. Uh, DTs or delirium tremens is 15% uh, fatal even when treated, and it's actually more deadly than opioid withdrawal. Um, and alcohol hallucinosis is a peculiar phenomenon that occurs when stopping drinking, or even before you stop drinking, where people see visions of wild animals and horrific beasts that are the kinds that might populate comic books, but they don't see the pink elephants that are fabled to occur. Uh, so. Uh, people have seizures, they can die of seizures or hypertension, but they do very, very commonly die of this. So if it's not done uh, slowly and safely. Now what else happens to women in alcohol? Women, alcohol is what we call, I don't know if we want to call it an affirmative action uh, toxin, but it gives women even more effects than men. Um, women develop cirrhosis twice as often as men do who drink the same amount of alcohol for the same amount of time. I think we all know about cirrhosis. It's not a good thing to have. Um, and in Europe, cirrhosis is the most com alcoholic cirrhosis is the most common cause for a liver transplant. In the U.S., it's actually Hep C that's the most common cause. Um, you know, there's a greater risk for alcohol-related myopathy in women, which means that the heart muscles give way much sooner in females than in male drinkers, even when the women drink less. And so then they're uh, subject to early, early cardiovascular disease, such as heart attack, stroke, and vascular, peripheral, peripheral vascular disease. Um, now here's something that I consider particularly important um, because it comes up a lot in treating patients. Um, breast cancer is promoted by alcohol. Okay. Breast cancer risk increases as uh, alcohol use increases. And that's particularly important because 11% of all women in America will get breast cancer. But there are other alcohol potentiated cancers as well, liver, mom, esophageal, colon, oral, facial. None of them are very good. 
And then alcohol and pregnancy. Now that's a whole different ballgame. Um, now anyone who's been in a restaurant has seen signs warning about alcohol and pregnancy. Alcohol increases um, the risk of miscarriage, stillbirth, prematurity, sudden infant death syndrome. We'll get into all the other problems with prematurity, but there are problems. But it also causes some really terrible fetal, fetal alcohol syndrome. So we now know that there are a lot more different kinds of fetal alcohol syndromes than we learned about in 1973 when it was first discovered. We now have five different kinds of fetal alcohol syndromes that are on a continuum. And I think it's a terrible tragedy, to say the least, to inflict this on someone. So what does fetal, what does the CDC do say about this? Because of this high risk, they recommend no alcohol for women of contraception, of childbearing age, who don't use contraception. Um, uh, we don't have time to go into all the reasons why, but there's some very good reasons why, even though a lot of people think that the CDC is wrong. One of the people who thought the CDC was wrong was a writer for Cosmopolitan Magazine, who actually wrote an article about why she drove Frank when she was pregnant. Um, anyhow, so in summary, I see that Jessica Jones is a really risky female role model, and especially risky as a feminist role model, because of all these complications. And we also know that comics can be very effective, or superheroes or sci-fi can be effective if they don't promote this. And we have Tony Stark and Iron Man as an excellent example. Um, and we also have the Laurel Lance and Arrow, who's another example. Laurel Lance uh, became the Black Canary after her sister, who was the original Black Canary, died. But Laurel was an attorney. She was a law student who became an attorney, who became an ADA who almost ruined her career and estranged her family because of her drinking. But she gets help, but she stops drinking. She becomes the Black Canary. Unfortunately, she dies as a Black Canary, but not because of alcohol. And she's going to resurface again, or at least Black Canary will resurface in an upcoming film on the Birds of Prey. Um, and I can't tell you what's going to happen there, because it's not out. But it should be interesting to see. Um, anyhow, so what's the future of Al Jessica's alcohol use? Well, your guess is as good as mine. I somehow think, as much as I am uh, campaigning against this, I have a feeling that it's not going to dissipate. Maybe they're going to add some disclaimers, but the fans who post online, from what I've read, seem to have a very different reaction than I do. But there are some good news. This is a little bit of good news here. I do give out this chapter to patients of mine to, uh, you know, to inform them of what the possible consequences are. And it seems to be well received, and I hope it's going to be able to save some lives in that regard. So that's it, and so long, folks. <laughs>things, what's no longer scary becomes funny. Um, Marlene, you seem to be saying, it is scary, so I need to be funny. I'd like you to talk about whether there is one direction from scary to funny or dialectic. That is, to what extent do we make jokes to stop things from being funny? To what extent do we make jokes only when they stop become funny, being funny? And if that is the case, how do they stop being scared? How do they... You could probably answer it better than I could. Okay. When I'm writing, and when I wrote this, I was impacted upon by Mel Brooks. And I love Broadway theater, and I know the words to all the Broadway plays that everybody knows because I've seen them all a hundred times. And I see myself in a line of discourse that is the next generation after Mel Brooks. And I'm certainly, certainly not anywhere as talented as Mel Brooks is. But when I was writing When Trump Changed, I wanted it to be in the vein of the producers because Mel Brooks liberated a concentration camp. And I went to Auschwitz about, I don't know, eight years ago. And walking into Auschwitz eight years ago was horrible. And I could not imagine <coughs> being Mel Brooks 
walking into Auschwitz at the end of World War II and liberating it. And what Mel Brooks did was make humor out of that in the producers and in springtime to Hitler. And there is no way that Trump is Hitler. But Hitler does not impact me directly because I was not alive during World War II. And what does impact me directly is, is Trump. And maybe I'm very sensitive to him because I am from Queens and I speak with his cadence and, his, and, his, and with his accent. So to answer your question, I'm trying to use humor in the way that Mel Brooks <coughs> does for something that is less atrocious. It's, it's a Jewish New York way of handling the situation with humor. And when I read my stories and I laugh at it, it makes me feel better. And Mel Brooks said that the worst thing that he could do to Hitler is to make people laugh at him. And Trump hates it when people laugh at him. And I don't have any political power, and that's what I have the power to do. And I try to do it in the best way that I could. Let me try to uh, piggyback off of that. Um, my wife and I have a, a disagreement. A guy that we both know teaches at uh, a private school in Manhattan called Friends Seminary was they attempted to fire him last year. Now he's the son of a con grandson of a concentration camp survivor, but he's, he was not raised Jewish. He's a Quaker. Uh, he's a math teacher, and he looked at a, uh, a drawing that he'd done of an angle, and he said, well, that looks like a, uh, a Nazi salute. And he gave one and said, Sieg Heil. And the school tried to fire him. The, uh, my wife says they should have fired him. They never should have let him back. I think that the school should have used it as a uh, learning opportunity. He did come back through arbitration. He was thinking of things in terms of the producers and in terms of the 1960s and the memory of the Holocaust from that time. We're living in a, uh, especially with anti-Semitism, uh, and this is my wife's argument, a very different time. And we cannot, she says, uh, have anything like that humor uh, making light of it in the classroom now, because too many people will then use that as a way of excusing it and increasing anti-Semitism. Now, I don't really have an answer uh, on uh, the, the ways of going back and forth between humor and horror, but there's definitely a connection between the two, and I do think that they are tied to the times. question, what I think is that science fiction is the perfect 
genre to deal with Trump because what Trump says his discourse is a lie every day. Politely, you can call it a fiction, but it's a prevarication. And realistic literature is not appropriate for him because he, everything about him is unrealistic. So you have to exaggerate the unrealisticness of him, as I said in my paper, to show that it's not normal. And that's what science fiction does because science fiction is more exaggerated than he is. And it could illuminate him. Science fiction is on the, on the cusp of, of social change. And Trump punk is useful literature to help us cope with it, like to come back to Eric's question about humor. I watch Colbert every night. I, I, I have sleep deprivation because I stay up watching late night television because I know that he's always there to laugh at Trump and it helps me get through the day. The, the humor is helpful to me. And Colbert loves science fiction and he sometimes alludes to science fiction and he did in the quotation that, that, I, that I used from him. And as I said, I think science fiction is a great place to cope with him and, and, and again he hates laughter and it shows him for what he is. The children's book. <laughs> I think my book is better. <laughs> it's my words, not his. That's his words. But I think it's funny because he's using a children again, you know, almost like fantasy, a children's book to combat. Well, that yeah. book, the text of it is what Trump said. So at, right. least, so at least Colbert is using it for good to help hurricane victims. Because Trump didn't help the hurricane victims, so Colbert is doing a good thing and taking his words and selling it to help the hurricane victims. Right. That's turning what, his real statements into fantasy. Which were unhelpful. Point out how Whose boat is this boat? <laughs> Would, yeah, it, a, boat a boat is a very, a boat is a rich people thing. I never had a boat. Whose boat is this boat? He's worried about what rich commodity, what, what rich person's commodity is this? And Colbert is taking those, I don't have words for his words, and using it for good to help people. And that's what the president should be doing, which he's not. Well, first a comment. Marshall McLuhan always liked to say that behind every joke is a serious grievance. That's what sort of energizes the joke and really makes us laugh. So apropos of Eric's question of what Eric and Marlene are saying, um, if somehow we're deprived of humor about Trump or about any noxious, horrendous thing like the Nazis, that deprives us of a way of attacking So I think that's a, that's a really serious issue. But I have a question for Marlene uh, in particular. Uh, obviously, uh, the Democrats did very well uh, earlier this month. We earned back uh, 40 seats. Um, so uh, do you see any change in your role in, in a situation in which uh, when you uh, wrote your book, Everything was just, you know, Trump and his ideas controlled all three branches of government. It, it reached it, the zenith of that terrible situation when Kavanaugh was confirmed. But now we seem to be moving into a situation where at least there are some rays of hope in, in real politics. So what role does your human play in that changed situation? Things are better but we're not out of the woods yet. We're not out of the woods until he's gone, and you said something about real politics, and I decided to do something real and political, which was last week, G Gerald Nadler was speaking at the Roosevelt House, and Gerald Nadler is going to be the head of the House Judiciary Committee. And to me, the head of the House Judiciary Committee is the savior, and Gerald Nadler is very, liberal and he's very Jewish. And I went on a quest to go to the Roosevelt House to ask head on the head of the House Judiciary Committee a question. And I, I, trooped, oh, I trooped up there and it was hard to ask a question because everybody wanted to ask a question but by God I was going to ask a question and I took my hand and rolled up my sleeve because my flesh was more seeable than my, than my blue shirt, and I asked him a one-sentence question. And my question was, if you subpoena 
Trump's tax returns, what is the expedient thing that you're going to do with the information? Because if, if he could subpoena everything and he doesn't do anything with it, it doesn't matter. So he did not answer my question and he told me how he's going to deal with the material and he said that what he's going to do is to try to see who Trump is financially beholden to. But that didn't answer my pragmatic question of, of what are you going to do with the information. And I wanted him to say I'm going to take action and I'm going to prosecute him, I'm going to impeach him, and he didn't say that. And I didn't say you didn't answer my question because, well, I think Nadler is the savior and I think he's a wonderful Congress person and I didn't want to say anything more. But he didn't answer my question in terms of pragmatism. He answered my question in terms of what information he's going to get. So to answer your question, it's a little bit better, <coughs> but but we're not we're not safe yet. And <coughs> and really, Mel Brooks liberated the concentration camp and the war was over and, and Springtime for Hitler was written well after the war was over, but we don't know what's going to happen, so I still think we need science fiction and humor to get us through until we get to a better place. And it's not as terrible as it was. Election night, nothing good happened until 11 o'clock, and I was crying from the emergency. I was very, very scared. I said, here we go again. It's much better because we, we all got together. And Nadler said that people came up to him and said, what are we going to do about this? And Nadler said, well, we're going to be safe when the cavalry comes over the hill. And the cavalry was all devoted. And the cavalry is we have this very brilliant, very liberal person, Nadler, in a position to represent us and, and do something, although he didn't tell me what it is he's going to do. Oh, yeah, I think we're... Just, uh, just about out of time. Yeah. yeah, about out of time. Just a quick question for Dr. Packer. I was going to ask, um, I mean, this is obviously important stuff that you're covering with Jessica Jones. What, what are some ways that you would suggest that would make it... Um, it would be useful for bringing up these topics with students, like if you have them read the, you know, some of these comics in a science fiction class. To bring up the topics about women and alcohol use? Yes. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you can go to the CDC website or the Public Health, you know, which is, uh, Center for Disease Control will give you all these statistics. Okay, so... Or I mean, this chapter in this book uh, pulls it together about women. Um, but uh, I think it's important that they know. Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, there's so many efforts to try to improve health and safety on campus, and it, it seems to me that this is something that's not addressed. There's a lot of information about saving women, about helping college women avoid sexual assault, but I don't hear anyone talking about helping them, helping them avoid the alcohol intoxication that not only uh, predisposes to sexual assaults, but to all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. So the CDC website of this chapter in this book, mm -hmm. um, and and that's that, but I, I personally, I think it's a very important issue. Okay, thank you. All right, so let's give our panelists a round of applause. Yeah, there's like 100 so students waiting no, outside. Yeah. I'm going to let them in. We Short 10 minute break, and we're going to have a great round table on. I'll tell you about the parents. Yeah.